And welcome to Pulp Mythos. I'm Brian here with Larry and Spencer, and we're going to be discussing Only Murders in the Building, episode number four, The Sting. If you've not hit the sub button, please do so. We're going to be reviewing this entire series as each episode drops. Leave a comment, leave a like, and another great episode, guys. Um, I love the fact that this entire episode revolves around bringing a delicious, large cooked turkey to Sting. <laughs> like, that's the central... Uh, Objective. Who is a and, vegan? <laughs> yeah. uh, I also like that. Uh, um, what's the character? Mabel didn't know quite who Sting was. Like she thought he was Bono, and then like I, I love that whole interaction. She's like, oh, the guy from YouTube. They're like, no, the police. Um, <laughs> I thought that was all played very, very well, and, and the fact that he's in on all the, you know, he's a part of the show and in on the jokes that it, you know, some a young person would be like, "Who the fuck is Sting?" <laughs> like I, I can appreciate that, but yeah, just initial thoughts before we dive into all the all the details. I loved it. <laughs> <laughs> Tina Fey, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, just I wonder if she's a writer on the show as well. I could see that. Um, I like the fact that, uh, you know, I thought that was her last, uh, in the first episodes, there's a, a shot when they were listening to that podcast and you see somebody and it's like raining or whatever. And it sort of looked like her, but I didn't think it was her. And now it's like, Oh shit. It was, it was in fact, Tina Fey. Yeah. That but, was, that was very surprising, you know, and it's, uh, <laughs> it's just, um, it's such a good cast. And I feel like given the tone of the show that, she is definitely a good addition to this cast. Oh yeah, per- absolutely perfect. Um, her her humor fits in perfectly with Steve Martin's in a uh, Martin Shorts. Like it's just very that deadpan kind of sarcastic stuff. It fits in perfectly. The you know in the beginning of the episode we kept seeing the um, <laughs> Bugs Bunny and Porky Pig. <laughs> and I, I did not know where that was going. And and it was okay, we saw it initially and I was like, okay, I didn't think about it. It just a little quick sight gag, and then it kept popping up. And it was crazy to me how important that was to the backstory of of um Steve Martin, uh, Charles. Yeah, this is the character Charles. And sort of the rev- revelation of that. Let's talk about him and the bassoon player, Jan. And sort of, you know, they, they they teased them a week ago in the, the elevator. There was some flirting. More more flirting this episode. They end up going on a date. He dropped one of the great, I actually wrote the line down, uh, one of the greatest lines ever. Because <laughs> she's telling him her backstory and about, you know, failed relationships, issues with her parents, all that. And then she's like, all right, it's your turn to, you know, open up to me. And he's just like... Or was it, oh, no, it's my turn to tell you all my red flags? <laughs> and like, like, it was the greatest <laughs> line. And it was the most honest, like, you know, she was a little taken aback by it. But I'm like, you, she should have, like, embraced that because it was the most honest shit that anyone could have ever said in <laughs> right. that moment. But obviously the revelation about who Lucy is, Lucy was actually somewhat of a stepdaughter. He was dating a woman named Emma. And they the relationship wasn't going well. It seemed like there was some weird dynamics with him being a father. And I don't know, Emma jealous of it. What do you guys think about that? Cause she ended up leaving him and taking Lucy away. And the porky pig bugs bunny tied into that because he had paid two performers to be there for a, um, I guess a mill or whatever that Lucy was supposed Dude. to attend, <laughs> but very sad, tragic. Obviously he confesses this to Jan cause he, he wants to go on another date with her. I love the moment where they're in the windows playing back and forth, all the stuff, all, all the things I griped about last week. And it wasn't really griping, but saying that, you know, I, I didn't really have a bead on his character to me. They completely answered just about all of it in this episode. And I loved all those moments with him. Uh, what do you guys think about his character arc, Jan, the revelations about Lucy, uh, all that stuff. Well, I think we've talked about it in a lot of other shows, even, you know, American Horror Story, which we just finished wrapping up, how sometimes like flashbacks are good and smaller doses. It gives you like a backstory to the people. And this one was sprinkled in so well that it gave you the backstory, it answered a lot of questions while still driving the story forward. And I think that is the perfect recipe, whether it's comedic, drama, whatever to adding backstories. I don't like the whole episode backstory stuff like that. That's me 
puts such a break on the momentum that shows have. I don't enjoy them. Uh, Titans, which I'm caught all the way up on, does that all the time. And every time, like, I catch a backstory episode, I almost just want to log off and, like, go read the Wikipedia, like, summary of the episode because I don't, it takes me out of the season so much sometimes. And the way that they did it in this is perfect. It, like you said, Brian, it explains the characters. It gives you the backstory while still driving the characters forward. Uh, I loved Holly. <laughs> Sorry, that was an office reference. Yeah. Jim, <laughs> the, <laughs> like that whole story where she's, I'm not quite sure how I feel about her character yet. Because although they work well together, they, you know, they are well together. It feels almost as though he's an experiment to her, kind of. Like, I don't know how I feel about it. Cause she's seems like she's psychoanalyzing him as opposed to trying to be with him. I think that's a personal. He, he wasn't that. wrong about the red flags. I mean, there was a lot. You're right. There was yeah. a lot. Like I did enjoy their dynamic, but there was a lot of things in her conversation where I'm like, Ooh, I don't know, man. Um, but he's also in a weird place in his life. So maybe, it, you know, maybe it'll work, but no, yeah. I, I agree with what you're saying. Well, yeah. And yeah. And that was very real because you have two people that are, or damaged in two very real ways or that have two very real, uh, very realistic problems, you know, two two people that the kind of people that you see in your day to day life, you know, whereas like you said, Steve Martin's character, I was like you said, Brian, I couldn't get a beat on who he was or, or what he was about, what his whole deal is until this episode. Now, you know, he's the type of, you know, sort of anxiety ridden all or nothing guy that was trying much too hard in his, his previous relationship seemingly to be a, more a family man than a husband. And that seems to be what destroyed it. And, you know, he's, he's, he's so all of no, or nothing that, you know, once that fell apart, he just isolated himself and decided to be alone. And he's just bad with people and doesn't really seem to understand motive, uh, moderation and, and overshares, you know, and it's, uh, it was an interesting peek into his head and, you know, and, and it was quick enough and, you know, that monologue was in character enough that it, it all fit perfectly. I love the line. I think, what was it? 70s, the new 40. And he's like, quit being mean. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, I love, yeah, the, I love her character and the level of sarcasm. Yeah. yeah. Dude, that was dying. <laughs> all of them. And then uh, Oliver, I love, you know, it's carried through his obsession with dips. <laughs> it's just dips and fingers. And she's like, oh. Like, I, I love all that. We we get a lot more with Oliver this week as well. Um, you know, his dog, or was it his dog? Yeah, it was poisoned. Um, he, his son is a vet. He comes to help him. And so we, we get a little bit with his son. And then, of course, the big reveal at the end about um, his son knowing that Mabel is has ties to Tim Kono. And so, you know, that's going to be a big, big deal. But any any um, favorite moments from with Oliver this week? You know, it, he was he wasn't the central focus as much as he was in like last week's uh, third episode. But this was more of Steve Martin's episode. But uh, still, fucking killing it. Yeah, he doesn't have to be the central focus to be my favorite character. Like it just <laughs> everything he does is hysterical. The whole like you said, the scene with the turkey and them going back and forth and him just crashing into steve martin's house and being like oh shit are you busy <laughs> like, i just need your oven mine's broke and like everything that he does i don't know how much of his lines are scripted because i know him and Steve martin you know both on snl both go back a long ways but a lot of their interactions when it's just those two i feel like a lot of their stuff isn't scripted so i, I would love for after the season's over for them to have an outtakes episode or something because I would love to see how well Selena Gomez plays off of their unscripted stuff also. Yeah, you're right. I'd, I'd really love to see like some behind the scenes on this show. Like I don't, I don't often watch you know, commentary for shows or movies, but I, I would for this one, just cause it's interesting how, how all this fits together and everything. And, and like you said, it just shows how, you know, just sort of self-involved this character is like you mentioned Spencer, that he would just, you know, go in his house and decide to use the oven. He'd barge in right away like that. You know, I, I love that scene too. Oh, I, I also like the, uh, the, the interaction we got with his son here that they're not like overusing the family, but they're used just enough. And in, in ways I didn't expect, but I should have known because 
obviously, if he had that apartment, his son lived in that building, and he would likely know no Mabel. You know, so you know that's a good way to string that together. That's how that's how they figure out that she knew Tim Kono. Yeah, and, and the oh, we we got the reveal that you know it the the story was that her friend was pushed from the from the building and you know that led to her death so the i that's one thing I, that's interesting because I, I didn't get the character is it oscar yes uh, yeah because he went to jail and i'm assuming it was for that but maybe they it was a manslaughter thing because he only went for like 10 years um, or something like that where he didn't cooperate or yeah that. yeah because it yeah yeah like, but i don't know I can't imagine uh, first involuntary <laughs> voluntary manslaughter. Maybe, um, I'm sure we'll get that answer here soon. But no, a confirmation that no, that that was exactly what was assumed that happened, and basically saying, "Yo, Mabel's bad news." Now they know she knows Tim Kona. Obviously, I'm, I'm sure they they're going to be bumbling around. Uh, they'll probably come out with it immediately. So you knew Tim Kona. Like I, I'm curious how that's going to play, but. She's now got a lead where she's, was it a Montrose Gems? I wrote that down. Um, Tim had all these fucking, all this jewelry and all, all this stuff. Like, is that part of this? I don't know. We have tie-dye guy, which uh, has been brought up. We see at the end, Mabel's walking down the street and someone in the tie-dye hoodie is trailing her. So there is, there is someone doing something bad. Who it is, does it tie to their childhood storyline? Is it Oscar? Um, I don't know. What are your thoughts? Well, you know, that makes me wonder, like you said, with the jewelry and the books and everything now, that I, I still have my suspicions that maybe Mabel didn't actually live in that building or that she doesn't actually have an aunt that lives in that building. I don't think she does. And I, I think that, uh, you know, like, although well, I mentioned this last episode that all the stilling, I think, was just her paying her way into that apartment potentially or or her you know, pawning the stuff that they still to survive. And, you know, and, and maybe even the books that Tim had were her books that he took from what, uh, quote unquote, her aunt's apartment, you know, that could have been her things. Yeah. I, I don't think that she, like you guys said, nobody, they always just mention her aunt, but even Oscar, they knew Oscar's dad. He's the super, like all these people, they knew their parents, but nobody has really talked much about her aunt. And I don't know if that's because they just, she feels like a throwaway character or if it's on purpose. And we're just supposed to try and figure out what kind of importance she has because the room that she's in, the apartment she's in is like dilapidated. Like it's, yeah, she's working on it and renovating it, but you never see her doing anything. She's not ever like in there. She's not in clothes that have paint all over it or anything. Like she's just in this dilapidated apartment with like a mattress. So it, he's, you know, hid in that, you know, apartment for forever. And as fancy as that building is, if it may cost a ton of money to redo it and they weren't willing to do that, or it's in somebody's name who's passed away and she was able to. Yeah. You know, where's make, her money coming from? Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah, even you know, if you take away the apartment, she dresses quite nice. You know what I mean? Like, um, we know where the other guy's money come. You know, we Oliver's uh, basically been hustling <laughs> to, to scrape by, and and Charles, uh, I'm sure, is sitting on a bunch of residuals, and you know, yeah, I say syndication, <laughs> syndication. But she's, mm -hmm. uh, we don't know. There's so many mysteries around her. Well, we also they showed us about all the stealing and everything else. What if all those clothes are somebody else's? What if she still has, you know, we talk about Oscar having the keys to everybody's apartments because he's a super. What if she either made copies of them or if she uh, somehow got a hold of those keys and she's just basically carrying on like she always did? You know, they're stealing stuff from people's apartments and she's stealing clothes from their apartments and all kinds of stuff. Well, yeah, and, and uh, nobody's ever mentioned her. Aunt. She's never mentioned her aunt by name. They know the apartment number and they've been in there for um, decades and yet, you know, so you would assume anybody that lives in this building, like they know Sting lives there. They, they seem to know everybody that that showed up at that meeting after, you know, Tim Kono's death. Uh, but 
you know, you think they would see the apartment number and they would go, oh, this is Miss So-and-so, but they, but they don't. So my assumption is like Brian said, that maybe it's a, you know, someone who was really well off that passed away and automatic payments are coming out for this place or, or they outright know it and Mabel's just stealing to pay the maintenance fees or whatnot. I like the, the scene where going back to sting real quick. So, you know, we, we, we learn that because they they have suspicions that he's, he's the one involved and we, we end up finding out, um, that he's excited when he f- thinks there potentially is a murderer because he thought Tim Kono took his own life. And the day before he told him to, he's like, you know, kill yourself because he lost Sting so much money. And we know that he had worked for, um, this firm and that he, he was shitty at his job or, or something went off and he lost a bunch of money and Sting was very pissed about it. And so thinking that oh no maybe he was murdered you know takes a lot of the um stress off of him and and he was even trying to write a song which i thought was funny uh as a dune fan uh you know stink stink and act sort of <laughs> what he wants um i liked all this i like the way his apartment was set up too i don't know i love the entrance and and the the doors and the hall and, and just the way it was all set up um I love how silent, how stunned they were by how bad the song was that he, he wrote. <laughs> yeah. He just kind of stared at him mouth agape, and he's like, what? Songwriting takes time, okay? Like, Sorry, it's hard. <laughs> <laughs> but, and I love the episode's title is The Sting. Like, that was funny, <laughs> funny, too. But I think the well, other you, big... Oh, go ahead. No, I was saying it because it's fully about Sting. Yeah. And it's for it to, you know, mention him like that, it's made it even better because it's like you said, the whole focus being around him and them not even for him to be as famous as he is, for them to not even know that much about him made me laugh even harder. The whole like turkey bit, like I said, the vegans, like everything about Sting. And like you said, Larry, I think about the uh like the song was real shitty and they're like, Ooh, that's not good. That's not gonna make your greatest hits album. <laughs> like everything about it was great and like you said brian him sting's been in other things like he's not a awful actor but him hamming it up in this to kind of follow suit with the steve martin and martin short made it that much better for me i just wonder how that went where they like did they write it with him already you know was this something early on or were they like hey we're gonna we need a celebrity because you know the fact to involve him even this much is this i don't know it's funny like we need a celebrity that lives in this apartment and we're gonna say that they you know may have committed the murder i would love to know the backstory to that maybe they're friends with sting shit um steve martin's a musician a legit musician who plays and tours and everything else so very possible also is uh <laughs> paul simon and <laughs> sorry <laughs> other people he did stuff with <laughs> so another big reveal and at the very end, we see Tina Fey's doing, and she's promoting a new podcast. And if you looked at the bottom of the screen, it was a time jump. This was in the uh, several months later, and she's basically and she calls it murderers, and only murderers in the building. And she's alluding to she never. I don't think she says anybody by name, but she's alluding to sort of what we're seeing unfold. And we we saw that little flash at the beginning of the first episode where. Uh, Mabel was standing there or sitting there and there was a dead body in front of her implicating that maybe she was involved, which I think probably she wasn't. Um, point being, it seems as if Tina Fey's next big podcast and I forget her character's name. I wrote it down. Cinda um, is about the stuff that's going on now. And then potentially there's going to be other murders and maybe Oliver Charles and Mabel will be, People will think they did it. I don't know. It, it, what did y'all get out of that scene? It it depends on how it goes from here. Because if all of a sudden they are more successful with their podcast because they basically have her plug in what they're doing, then by all means. However, if she steals their thunder, I mean, she'll. Pro- I think she'll make a good villain, <laughs> like a good. I mean, other than people murdering people, they're probably the villain too. But I think that she would make a good antagonist too because. She stole their idea, and that's something to drive it forward for more seasons, I think. I'm ho- I, I hope there's more seasons. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Yeah. But I feel like that's what they're trying to do as far as with her storyline. But I love Tina Fey, and they did a great job incorporating her into all of this. 
Yeah, and that's that's my question. My initial thought was that like, oh, she's she's framing them. Maybe she even knows that you know it's it's not them, but she thinks the idea of pinning this on them would sell, you know, and would would be a a big hit podcast for her, you know, and and because because she, she's not just a person now, she's a she's a business, and she'd likely the minute they came to her, that was probably their first mistake because she works in the same genre, and she was and the fact that she mentioned it was st- that. They mentioned that it looked like it was Sting, and she's like, "Oh, celebrity murders—that's big, you know. Why would they think that she she wouldn't steal that, you know, of of all people, you know?" Yeah, so, she just signed that deal uh, for thirty million dollars. Yeah, so she um, might be able to dude, renegotiate I- on this this big, you know, um, like like on this big series of murders, which potentially even involves Sting. So yeah, of course she's gonna she's gonna push to steal their concept. I loved when the the girl who she had, who was basically writing her taglines and stuff, like the back and forth, and basically just she put her, her down so hard in that <laughs> with the, well, the writing and everything. She's like, yeah, she's got the voice for it. <laughs> it reminded me of a uh, big fat liar with Paul Giamatti, like how he was just basically like a giant asshole to everybody underneath him, or every episode of Howard Stern. Um, or <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah but, go, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say this all makes sense. Cause I was curious during that whole scene, I was like, why is she giving them the time of day? Because she doesn't seem like the type of person that would make time for anybody who wants to start a small he said, podcast. He's like, we go to the same cupcake place. <laughs> <laughs> that was another great Mark short line. Like I, but I laughed out loud at that. Yeah, exactly, and that's how they know it. And that doesn't seem like that would be enough to to get her attention. No, and then uh, Charles knew a guy who was uh, friendly with her through something. But, but I just loved it, Oliver. His whole, <laughs> he's like, I think I can get her. We go to the same cupcake place. <laughs> uh, yeah, lines like that, man. It, it's just just funny. Yeah, the comedy is so good. Nice. <laughs> um. And even, you know, I brought it up earlier, but the scene on uh, where they were sitting out their windows, Jan and Charles and playing back and forth. It's simple. It's it's three or four minutes, but it was charming. It was a very charming scene. And I was like, yeah, very, very well, well done. Little sequence there. Um, But yeah, I can't, man, I can't wait to see how this all unfolds. Uh, The next week's episode is, I believe, titled The Twist. Um, assuming it's going to go into Mabel because we saw her being pursued, or at least somebody sh- shadowing or telling her. Um, now that Charles and Oliver knows that she knew Tim Kono has been keeping that a secret, so I think some of that's going to come out. Maybe we'll get a little more of her backstory and figure out what's going on. But you know, it's the episode's called the twist, so that, I'm assuming there's going to be a twist. <laughs> well, I feel like the the hoodie person may be Oscar. It could be. It could. As a matter of fact, it could be somebody trying to keep her safe. It could be one of those type things. Yeah, I'm, um, that's what I'm thinking it is, but I don't. Know. I don't know. Yeah, well, I'm just, yeah, I don't know. And, and that makes sense, since like you've mentioned, Brian, we've flash forward a bit in this series. Sometimes that you know, perhaps even you know, that's a flash to them. Or that's they've already know that know at this point that you know she knew Tim Kono and that the, about the previous murder, murder. So it could be, you know, it could be. Uh, could be one of them uh, following uh, one of our other two leads following her as well, you know, for that reason, or, or just out of suspicion because you know Martin Short, he's, his character mentioned that uh, that he was suspicious of, of Mabel from the beginning. How so, great would it be if it was Martin Short's old stubby self inside that hoodie? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that'd be good. It's Nathan Lane. <laughs> Dude, <laughs> what if it's his kid? His Maybe son. His uh, yeah, yeah, that's true. Uh, oh, that's the twist. <laughs> well, and, that, and at that, you know, his son may have reasons too because his son knew Mabel and and Tim Kono. You know, so his son is potentially even a suspect. There's all yeah yeah. The more people who were who lived or were in that building, and you know, 
at that time everyone's connected now like you're starting to see all the connections so it, it definitely opens up a lot of possibilities uh as far as you know what what exactly is going on um i Things believe it's existing. 10 episodes so next week would be the midpoint so yeah yes typically when you throw a twist in your story anyway so should be fun anything else regarding episode four of only murders in the building i don't have anything but i just checked it is 10 episodes yeah me neither i'm just real curious what the what the big twist is yep so yeah we'll find out next week uh what the twist is um <laughs> we appreciate everyone listening uh, if you have any theories or anything we completely missed that was obvious please put it in the comments below we will be reading that and well, uh and, oh, right now i just went to imdb to see how many pages or how many episodes it was and i mean we're already talking about the show but oscars listed in all 10 episodes and the only per and they haven't showed them yet but they've shown the tie-dye hoodie person in every episode they've mentioned him in every episode so that's the only way that i can think of him being a little, a little detective work <laughs> there you go um so yeah, we will see y'all next time. Bye. Bye.